So my name is Subhi Saka and uh, I'm the head of the particle theory group at the University of Oxford in the Rudolf Pyle Center for Theoretical Physics. Uh, but in fact, um, uh, I don't just work in theory. I also uh, work on a couple of experiments. Uh, once at the South Pole, it's called Ice Cube. It uh, detects high energy neutrinos from outer space. And another one is called the Cherenkov Telescope Array, which looks for high energy gamma rays. But uh, essentially, I'm um, at the interface between theory and experiment. And my main interest is in uh, what we call phenomenology. In other words, understanding in terms of fundamental laws what we see around us. And so you've done work on the supernova. Uh, that's right. So I'm not an astronomer. Uh, but uh, the supernova data has been now made public. And our contribution was to uh, analyze the data in a statistically rigorous way, which we believe it has not, not been done in the past. Uh, the point is that uh, the supernovae are uh, objects which are just like all astronomical objects. They're not all identical. So in fundamental physics, we are used to the idea that you know every electron in the world is identical. In fact, you know, John Wheeler famously said it's the same electron everywhere. Okay, but supernovae are not quite the same. However, they are similar enough to each other that they are used as what's called standard candles. They put out the same amount of energy. Um, actually, in practice, they are so-called standardizable candles. You can make corrections based on how long they last and what color they look uh, to try to reduce them to the same standard object. And then you can uh, ask uh, how faint are they looking. And then you measure the redshift of the galaxy they are embedded in. So that gives you a measure of the distance. And then from that, you can try to work out uh, if the expansion rate of the universe is you know, slowing down or speeding up or staying the same. And uh, there was a major uh, discovery in the late 1990s that uh, apparently, according to the supernovae, the expansion is speeding up. So in practice, what, that, what they actually measure is that the distant supernovae are about 30% further away than you would have expected them to be had the universe been slowing down. So that, of course, raises immediately lots of questions. When you say that 30% further away than you expected them to be, uh, what if the supernovae had just become you know, 30% less bright? Right? That's always a worry. And so the whole game is one of trying to identify and pin down these systematic uncertainties. And that's where I thought the subject was until we actually looked at the data, which was made public in 2016. And then we discovered that the statistical analysis had actually allowed for the possibility of uncertainties in each measurement. Uh, and they then tried to fit the model of the accelerating universe to the data. So the point is that if you allow the uncertainty on each measurement to be arbitrarily large, then you can fit any model. And indeed, they did. But if you adopt a more, uh, the correct word for it would be a more, uh, not so much honest, as a more uh, rigorous way of statistical analysis called the maximum likelihood method, then it turns out that the evidence is not really that strong. And very recently, uh, we have discovered that this apparent acceleration is not the same in every direction. It seems to be highest in the direction in which we are already, we know, we are moving through the cosmic microwave background. So that's what makes us think that this is not really the effect of dark energy at all. It's simply an artifact of our being located in what is technically called a bulk flow, our galaxy and neighboring galaxies are all coherently moving in one direction at several hundred kilometers a second. Uh, this is not the Hubble expansion. This is a deviation from the Hubble expansion. We don't know why it's doing that. It could be a big lump of matter nearby pulling us. Be that as it may, the fact that we are in this bulk flow 
means that we are not what uh, we thought we were, Copernican observers. We are not typical observers. We are very special observers. And I think that dark energy is an artifact of our not taking account of this fact that we are not uh, typical. And why does that make us special uh, observers? Special in, only in the sense that we are not uh, what the theory assumes we are. There's nothing fundamentally special about it. It's just like, you know, I'm sitting at this particular spot on this particular river bank. I could be sitting at some other spot. There's nothing special about the spot per se. But depending on which spot I pick, I'll see the river, river differently. And does this mean that uh, if the evidence is for that there's uh, more experiments you can do in that uh, to collect the evidence which isn't sport? Or why does it lead you to say that it's not dark energy, that it's the flow? Because the only direct evidence for dark energy is the fact that it is supposed to be causing this accelerating expansion. So uh, let me say that there is a way in which we'll find out, well, quite soon, within 20, 30 years, because uh, if the universe expansion is actually accelerating, then what we should do is measure the velocity of expansion today and then 10 years from now, right? That's what you call acceleration, right? And so far, all the measurements we have been talking about are made at one point in time. But quite soon, with a, a new uh, telescope called the Extremely Large Telescope, ELT, it's being constructed right now in Chile, it will be possible to do what we call real-time cosmology. So you can actually monitor the redshift of your object and see it changing in time. And over a period of 10 years, it will change by about one part in 10 to the 9. But it's su sufficiently sensitive, the instrument, that it can measure that. So this is called the redshift drift. And you know people had thought, thought of this quite a long time ago. But they thought it would never be possible to measure it. And now with current technology, we can. So we'll know eventually if the expansion rate is actually accelerating. But meanwhile, uh, apart from the supernovae, people have found other ways to look for dark energy. But they're all indirect. They don't directly measure the effects of dark energy. They effectively measure the other components of the universe apart from dark energy, such as how much matter it contains, uh, such as uh, you know how much space-like sections are curved and so on. And then within the theoretical model, there is a connection between the things that you measure and the dark energy part, the cosmological constant, which you don't. And you infer that in the context of the model. But that inference is only as good as the model is correct. So if the model was, which was formulated 100 years ago is not the last word. For example, the model assumes that the universe is totally uh, homogeneous, smooth, and every direction is the same. But in our real universe, the universe is very lumpy. And we, it turns out that all directions are not the same. Uh, whether this really has cosmological significance or not is still under study. This is not, you know, what I'm talking about is not broadly accepted by any means by the majority of cosmologists. But uh, we do feel we are on to something because what we are doing is entirely data driven. There's no theory in it at all. We are just asking a very simple question. Is the universe isotropic? Is the universe homogeneous? What effect would that have on us? We are at a particular position in this network, this so-called cosmic web of galaxies depending on the direction you look at, might we infer a different thing than if I looked in the opposite direction? So these questions have never been asked because the assumption has been that all directions are equivalent. But, you know, our real life experience tells us that, uh, you know, usually that is not the case. And you can draw the wrong inference if you believe in a degree of symmetry which the real world does not reflect. So do you believe it should uh, be data-driven rather than sort of grand theories such as supersymmetry or blue sky thinking? Oh, absolutely, because the theory here uh, was actually, uh, have, that has, has failed miserably because that's what I talked about in the debate earlier, this Einstein's cosmological constant. Uh, he recognized that the equation has a certain underlying mathematical structure 
that allows you to add a term called the cosmological constant to the equations. He added it for the wrong reason. He thought you needed to make the universe static and now we know that actually it need not be so and most of the time uh, the universe could be expanding or contracting. But uh, that is not actually a failure on his part at all. He recognized that the term had to be there and it is not really Einstein's choice whether the constant has to be there, is there or not. So this famous story about how he said it was his greatest mistake, that has never been documented by the way. It was George Gamma who was famous for telling fibs, <laughs> making up stories, who claimed that Einstein had said that in a letter to him. But Einstein, uh, none of his notebooks actually show that he had ever said this. Uh, anyway, the point is that that term is there and that term we understand today in the modern uh, understanding of physics, which is quantum field theory, it corresponds to the energy density of the vacuum. And the basic problem is that the energy density of the vacuum, uh, if it couples to gravity in the way that Einstein thought of, would essentially have ever prevented our universe becoming the way it is today. So we don't understand that. This is the cosmological constant problem. You know, Steven Weinberg, who is one of the best known particle theorists there is, he said it is the bone in our throat. Uh, I think that really perfectly summarizes just what a big problem it is. We have, nobody has been able to solve it. And then after many years of trying to ignore it, because it affects nothing in the laboratory, you can do your experiments at the LHC and elsewhere, the cosmological constant has no effect there. So you can afford to ignore it, but not in cosmology. That's the only place where it rears its head again. And now astronomers claim they have found a value for it, which is non-zero. That raises another problem. Why is it important only today? You know, because the, the value of the constant is very, very small. It's of order the other energy densities today. And the other energy densities would have been bigger in the past. So there is a why now question. So lots of people are happily employed in trying to write papers, trying to address these questions. Uh, I think that no progress will be made on that because it's a very, very fine-tuned problem. But it has forced, I think, uh, fundamental theorists to look at this unsolved issue. And um, I don't think I'm clever enough to ever solve it, but I'm in good company. Nobody else in the world has been able to do it either. But I think this is really, a, you know, the kind of challenge that uh, today's generation of physicists, is, you know, should look forward to, that there is something really, really major and important for them to tackle that everyone else before them has failed to solve. And just playing games with it, calling it dark energy, quintessence, whatever, I think is just completely and utterly pointless. So that is just going to go away when we do better experiments and discover that the expansion is not really accelerating. I think we'll discover that the cosmological constant is in fact as close to zero as we can measure it. That will bring back the old cosmological constant problem, which was bad enough, serious enough. So, you know, this is a win-win situation. And if you're working from a strong base of data, where then do your opponents find the, the biggest issues in the work that you're doing? They would say that there are many lines of evidence. It's not just the supernovae. In fact, most of my colleagues would say that, oh, we always thought there was something dodgy about the supernovae. What about the cosmic microwave background? That's precision cosmology. What about other things, baron acoustic oscillations and so on? Uh, the truth is that uh, all those arguments, as I said, depend on assuming the answer. They are inferences in the framework of the standard cosmological model. If you broaden out the standard cosmological model, then those inferences cannot be drawn, right? And therefore, I think there's these people really ought to expand their horizons a bit. The reason why they have not done that so far is because they have been told that everything fits so beautifully. Why, you know, why do you want to try if things fit so beautifully? That actually is a selection effect. There is a strong evidence for what we call selection bias. So, you know, out of, I don't know, 43 measurements of this cosmological constant since the time it was discovered, you will find, you would expect to find uh, a distribution Right? But somebody who studied this pointed out that they're all clustered around the 
most precise measurement, which was done by in the past by something called the WMAP satellite, they're all within one standard deviation of the WMAP satellite. Uh, that suggests that uh, there has been an unconscious you know, bias in determining the answer. It is not scattered. So I'm very hopeful that the next generation of experiments will be done with so-called blind hypothesis testing. Okay, and that would certainly be progress. That's what we do, for example, at this ice cube experiment. We open the box with the data only after we have formulated the hypothesis that we are going to test. And what would the ramifications be um, if you were able to prove that the universe was expanding at an accelerating rate? Well, that just means that we have to uh, rethink how to construct a cosmology. And I don't think I'm saying anything radical here. I mean, our current model of cosmology goes back a hundred years. There is no other uh, domain of human activity I'm aware of, intellectual activity, where we are actually using a hundred-year-old model to interpret data today. We certainly don't do that in particle physics. Our standard model of particle physics goes back to the 70s. Well, okay, so that's already 45, 50 years old. But, you know, it's not a hundred years old, right? And if you think of other fields, I don't know, neuroscience, biology, they're not using 100-year-old theories. You know, we are in cosmology. And the reason why I think we have to move away from that is simply so that we can be courageous enough to accept the universe as it is and not to try to impose this idealized notions of symmetry and, you know, perfection upon it, which is really what was done. And it was done because we had no data then. If you don't know something about the universe, anything about the universe, you obviously assume it to be as simple as is possible. But today we have the data. So I think we really have to start again and start constructing a model of cosmology. And hopefully there will be the mathematical breakthroughs that allow us to apply the general theory of relativity to situations which are not as symmetric as the original model. Uh, so this is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy to take into account what I said that, you know, you might see different things in different directions, okay, and that your particular location in the universe might matter. It just complicates things and people say, why, why complicate things? Why not stick with the simple model, everyone's happy. Well, I'm not happy because it brings up this dark energy which makes absolutely no sense in physics, in fundamental physics. Astronomers don't understand this. For them, it's one number. For us, it is the bone in our throat. So I would like to get rid of dark energy, not because it gets rid of the fundamental problem. It just brings back the cosmological constant problem. But it would allow us to re-engage with that problem, which I think possibly will real, require a real advance in quantum gravity. So currently we have no theory of quantum gravity which can engage with this problem. Neither string theory nor loop quantum gravity have had anything to say about the problem of how vacuum energy couples to gravity. So we'll be forced to confront it. And that I think might lead to progress. Are there any grand theories such as like string theory or talk about supersymmetry but that capture your imagination? Well, I mean, string theory certainly captured all our imaginations when it was formulated. I was, I remember listening in certain theory lecture room to when the first anomaly cancellation was discovered in string theory, which was 1984. And everyone was thinking, you know, within two, three years, we'll, everything will be sorted out. Well, that was, what was it? Over 34, 35, 36 years ago. That's because it has turned out to be much more difficult than people thought. And uh, you no, know, the idea was that the strings themselves, their dynamics create the space-time in which the strings move. But that has proved too ambitious a construction. So currently all of string theory is formulated in a flat space-time background, in Minkowski space-time, uh, which means that the real dynamics of what string theory could tell you we still don't know about, it's just too difficult. It's already very, very difficult at this stage. And the full string theory, nobody really even knows what string theory is. That's what, you know, I know some real string theories and that's what they tell me, that it's hard to even formulate what is string theory. 
So in a sense, I guess we are lucky that we have hit upon something like that, which has got such depth and complexity. But at the same time, progress is frustratingly slow. But then that's really because we are impatient. If you look at the history of science, most things took, you know, century to work out. And why do you expect that in 35 years we'll have the answers? So I think we should give string theory more time and string theory is more time. Uh, but they should perhaps also be a bit modest and not claim that they're going to solve everything in three years. And what are some future research projects or projects you're involved with at the moment? Where is your, where are your work taking you? Well, I'm, as I said, a phenomenologist. I'm interested in phenomena rather than in high theory, as it were. I'm saving that for when I retire. <laughs> you know, that's this, it's a joke that you start thinking about the nature of time and the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, you know, when you have the leisure or in, yeah. in your armchair, because they are difficult problems. And, you know, Kurt Gödel, that's what he said when he finally went to the institute in Princeton. You know, I remember someone interviewed him and he said, what are you thinking about? And he said, the nature of time. And, you know, so of course, he never made any other contribution to it. It was too hard. Uh, so I, I think I'll reserve those things for later. But uh, right now, apart from phenomenology, of course, I'm interested, as many people are, in information. That's the sort of key to, uh, I think, understanding, you know, lots of emergent phenomena like biology. You know, what, what makes a life form different from the inanimate molecules that you put together to make life? Uh, there is clearly additional information in the life form. How that information got embedded, how it gets passed on, that, of course, is most of biology today, how that information is, you know, propagated and propagated in such an elegant way and at the same time extremely inefficient way. You know, most of the information in the DNA is not actually used for synthesizing proteins. We don't know what it is for. And there is clearly a huge amount of evolutionary history written, you know, in the construction of these molecules and how they work together. That's all fascinating stuff. But, you know, we like to keep things simple in physics. We don't like complicated stuff. So, the questions we would ask are things like, if I throw a living being into a black hole and then they get evaporated and the black hole radiation contains the information about this person that was thrown in, can we put it together and create that person again? So currently the answer must be in principle, can we do that? I mean, that's, that's actually become a, a cutting edge question called the black hole information paradox as to whether, forget about life, even for an inanimate object, is that possible? And uh, it's not so much that the answer to that question itself is the be all and end of everything, but the act of thinking about it, the kind of tools that you have developed to think about it, that creates new you know, ways of looking at things. So, you know, as with most intellectual endeavors, I think the journey has to be the reward. You know, we don't really expect to have an unified theory or solve everything, uh, but we should have lots of fun doing it. And finally, we're at an Arts and Ideas Festival. I wonder why or if you think uh, big ideas still matter, this sort of endeavour, intellectual endeavour. Why, what drives you? Why, what, uh, what are you looking for? Why should it be an important part of our society? Well, it's like they say, you know, you climb Mount Everest because it's there. So the very fact that we are impelled to think about things that are not directly, uh, let's say, relevant to our survival. That's, I suppose, what makes us sentient beings. You know, I'm not going to say things like, well, it's thinking about these things that make us uh, wonder how to do experiments to test them. And then we build a laboratory called CERN. And then we have a bunch of people in something called the TC building who are uh, there to help the physicists talk to each other and you know what? One of them invents something called the World Wide Web. And that changes everybody's life forever, right? That's exactly what happened. Tim Berners-Lee was an undergraduate in physics at Oxford at Queen's. And he worked in the TC building. And he used to work with people who need to communicate independent of, you know, whatever. And it, that was not foreseen. That was not planned. And that's why it didn't come out of Microsoft. It didn't come out of IBM. It came out of a place but people are just trying to solve problems for the sake of solving problems, right? So I think the material benefits to humankind of what we do 
should be bleeding obvious. I don't need to spell that out. Right? I don't need to give you a list of all the things that has led to. But I don't think that that's the main reason. The main reason we should be doing it is because we are creatures who feel the need to do it just as we feel the need to draw paintings on cave walls and the need we feel the need to dance, we feel the need to make music. So intellectual thought is part of the same, uh, you know, glorious sort of set of abilities that we have. So you should use them in the same way. The only issue is that it costs money. That is true. That is why it has become a political issue. But actually, I don't even need to say this either. It costs very little money. Uh, I mean, whole of CERN basically costs as much as in one medium-sized university. So there are, I don't know, how many hundreds of universities in Europe alone. So you're asking whether you should have one or more, one more or one less university. Is that really such a big question? I mean, so surely we can afford this. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.